Well done. Uh, our next speaker is Ian Crawford, an astronomer uh, turned planetary scientist who's a professor of planetary science and astrobiology at Birkbeck College, which is a few blocks away from the British Museum in London. Uh, this is a college of the University of London. He's a fellow and currently the senior secretary of the UK's Royal uh, Astronomical Society and a fellow of the BIS. Uh, he is a strong advocate for renewed human exploration of the moon, the development of spacefaring infrastructure in the solar system, and the eventual attainment of interstellar spaceflight. In the latter capacity, he leads the science and astronomical target modules of Project Icarus Starship Study. Uh, a more detailed summary of his work is available online at the university site. Uh, Ian's going to talk to us about what is between here and there and where we might go. Thank you, thank you, Jim. So, good, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank both Jim and Greg Benford for the invitation to attend this very interesting and exciting and, I think, important gathering. Uh, I, do have the easy, I do have the easy job here in that, um, as, as we've already heard, building, building um, starships is the hard thing. Uh, figuring out where we might send them is the easy thing. The universe is full of places we would send starships to if only we could build them. But others, others have spoken about, um, about building starships. This is what an, uh, one of these beautiful Adrian Mann illustrations of the Daedalus concept that, uh, that Adam referred to, and it's an enormous undertaking, 150 metres long and 80,000 tonnes of helium-3 and deuterium. Um, but, uh, but designed to accelerate a, a payload to about, about 15, 13, 12 percent of the speed of light, if memory serves, which would get one to the, get the payload at any rate to the nearest star in about 36 years. Um, I will have to say something about um, the architecture of interstellar space missions, uh, leaving aside the, the exotic things that we've heard from John Kramer about. Of course, these would be game-changing things if they happened. But I think the, the only honest approach to those is that our knowledge of the underlying physics is so, um, is so non-existent that it, it really is probably wishful thinking to build, predicate starship designs on wormholes or anything like that. So assuming that we have to cope with the laws of physics as we currently understand them, we just have to find ways of accelerating masses through, through normal space. And, and that does entail um, some, some issues for what, what the kind of architecture of an interstellar mission that we might want to get useful scientific results from. So the Daedalus concept, it's a lot easier to, to accelerate this massive payload uh, than it is to accelerate it and then decelerate it again from 12% of the speed of light. So, so the Daedalus concept was a flyby mission, and I shall argue that uh, that's really going to be quite limiting in terms of scientific output. Uh, and that really we're going to have to bite the bullet and learn how to decelerate massive payloads at the, at the other end. Um, now, um, I've, I approach this uh, from coming from a science background, and I'm going to make the science case for starships. Uh, that's not to say that I think science is the only justification for starships, and, and indeed I think science is not the only justification for space exploration anyway. Uh, but still, science is a beneficiary of space exploration, and science will be a beneficiary of interstellar exploration. So let me just outline the scientific benefits of building starships. Starships are scientific tools. Um, it's easy to break these down into, again, leaving aside wormholes, in which case you wouldn't travel through the interstellar medium. But for, for starships that travel through normal space, then to get to any other star, you, of course, have to travel through all the stuff between us and there. And that poses potential challenges, as we've heard about, because the interstellar medium is not empty and it contains dust particles and things that could be a threat to the spacecraft. Um, it also has uh, benefits in that the interstellar medium could potentially be used to fuel spacecraft or to decelerate a spacecraft using a magsail device. Um, but in addition to all of that, the interstellar medium is scientifically interesting. So, but this is science you would get for free because the vehicle has to travel through it anyway. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing you would hope to do with a, a starship from a scientific point of view would be to, to make in de detailed studies of target star or target stars, um, especially target stars if you've targeted a multiple star system like Alpha Centauri, which I shall come to later. Um, so being able to make, we can learn quite a lot about stars with telescopes 
and we're building bigger and bigger telescopes. So stellar astrophysics is not in itself a driver for, a very strong driver for building starships. But still, if you're going to travel to the stars, uh, then you will certainly be able to learn more about these stars if you can make your measurements in situ about them, for the same reason we know far more about the sun than any other star, just because we can observe it close up. Uh, but the, real, the, really, the real scientific benefits of building starships will be to study pl any planets that may exist, and we now know planets certainly will exist about almost any star we might choose. And then, in particular, astrobiological, well, the planetary science studies of those planets themselves will be of great interest, but of even more interest will be studies of any life that may, may exist or have existed upon them. So I summarised all of this in this paper in the Journal of British Interplanetary Society a couple of years ago. Um, so, just going through these briefly, we've had several, um, uh, well, Jim said I was going to talk about the interstellar medium, so I, I'm glad I put this slide in. This is, a, um, this is a sketch of the local interstellar medium. It's based on work by Seth Redfield from Wesleyan College uh, in Chicago, I think. Um, it has a sun in the centre, and it's projected onto the galactic plane, and this is, these, are, these are light years, and here are some nearby stars. Um, and the, the, blue, the blue clouds are the local cloudlets, the local fluff uh, that exists in our part of the galaxy. Now, it is true that the sun is in a very low-density part of the interstellar medium, and these local cloudlets are nothing like the big dark clouds that we see projected against the Milky Way. But even by interstellar standards, these are very low-density clouds. Um, in the, in the, the sun is just on the, the edge of one of them, called the local interstellar cloud, and it has a density of perhaps 0.1 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimetre, probably 30 to 40% ionised, we talked about earlier. Um, but the black bits, the gaps between these local cloud cloudlets, it's really empty, with a, a density of perhaps 0 0.005 protons per cubic centimetre. And there they will be protons, because it's almost entirely ionised. Um, so, but you see this, this fluffy, this fluffy um, this, these, the gaps in, this, um, in the nature of the distribution of the local cloudlets will have implications. I mean, scientifically, it's interesting, but just to come back to the design of starships, you, this is something we need to know about. If you're going to build a ramjet to collect the interstellar medium as fuel, or you're going to use a mag sail to decelerate, it matters to you whether your route takes you through this local fluff or through gaps in between. Certainly matters whether your target star is in a gap between these, these clouds if you're going to use a mag sail to try and decelerate. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for learning more about the local interstellar medium. The first starships will necessarily tell us about it. Um, but there is a strong case for learning a bit more about it in advance. And so there are, there are strong scientific reasons for wanting to send um, uh, vehicles, space probes beyond the heliopause to, to a few hundred astronomical units to make direct measurements of the, 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 the structure of this local interstellar matter, which can then inform the design for for, star, for starships. Um, and in the context of the, the Icarus project, I, I wrote a review on the structure of the local interstellar medium with this in mind, which uh, got published a couple of years ago, which I, I can point people to if they're interested. Right, having got our space vehicle across the interstellar medium uh, to some target star, I just want to say something briefly about science you would, you would hope to do at a target star system. So obviously, if you had a space vehicle close to Alpha Centauri or Tau Ceti or, or, or Proxima or, or whatnot, you would be able to do the same kind of stellar astrophysics as what we do of studying our own, our own, our own star. So, and in particular, you'd also be able to study the circumstellar environments about, about these stars. And some stars have more interesting circumstellar environments than others. Um, but several of the nearby stars are surrounded by dust disks that are either solar systems in formation or the, the recent products of solar system formation. Um, the star Epsilon Eridani, which is 10 and a half light years away, is a relatively local star and has a planetary system and a dust disk. So from a stellar astro... So this is an infrared image of a dust disk around Epsilon Eri. Um, so it's, uh, the, uh, being able to travel to the stars would enable you to make in situ observations of these very interesting astrophysical objects. Um, but strong though those science cases are from a sort of pure astrophysics point of view, it's clear that they're not really going to be sufficient to have anyone invest in building starships. And so the real scientific, um, the real scientific benefits will come from studying planets uh, and possible life thereon. Now, we, we already know that we need spaceships to study planets because this is how we explore our own solar system. Uh, we, we, 
observational astronomy had probably taught us, not quite, but almost as much as it was able to do about the planets in our solar system by the dawn of the space age. So the planets were known, their atmospheric compositions were known, their orbital elements were known, their masses were known, at least if the planets had moons, their masses were known. Um, a lot of this basic planetary, planetary information about our own solar system had been gathered telescopically, uh, and, and to an extent, probably a lot of that information can be gathered around about exoplanetary systems also. But the real revolution in planetary science came when it was possible to build space vehicles and actually visit these planets in situ. Um, and so the same, since that is how we explore our own solar system, it is just obvious, I think, that, that the same, that we will only learn about other planetary systems to a comparable extent as we uh, know about our own when it becomes possible to make in situ scientific measurements um, on, 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 from orbit about them or on their surfaces. So you'll recognize this picture. These are the layered sedimentary rocks in Aeolis Mons in Gale Crater, photographed by um, the Curiosity rover. Um, Curiosity would not be able to explore Mars like um, uh, in, the, in the kind of detail that it is doing, searching for evidence of past or present life if Curiosity was flying by Mars at 10% of the speed of light. It's imperative uh, that these, these, the, the search for life uh, past life, current life, um, even basic geology requires in, in, sophisticated scientific instruments in contact with the materials that we're studying. Can't be done by telescopes from the Earth. Can't really be done by um, orbiting spacecraft. Uh, but this requires sophisticated scientific instruments to be carried across interstellar distances and landed all in one piece, able to make their measurements. And so this really is the key, to my mind, the, one of the, the key science drivers for developing an interstellar spaceflight capability. Um, leaving SETI aside, where it is possible that we may contact advanced extraterrestrials who can speak for us, in the more, it speak to us, in the, more li in the more, much more likely case where what we're searching for are microorganisms or even fossil microorganisms in ancient sedimentary rocks and we want to know what the biochemistry of this alien life is like, what its ecology is like, what its evolutionary history has been. None of this stuff can be learnt telescopically. But then neither can much of it be learnt by a space probe that's flying by at 10% of the speed of light. It requires scientific instruments deployed on these exoplanet... It will require scientific instruments to be deployed on these exoplanetary surfaces. So since planets are the uh, main target of interstellar space exploration, I just want to say a little bit about planets, exoplanets. We haven't, we haven't had a, a great deal of... Uh, exoplanets haven't been discussed much over, over the last couple of, couple of um, uh, days, but it, it is one of the most exciting fields in, in contemporary astronomy um, because basically we now know the sky is full of planets. And there are two main techniques, a half a dozen techniques for discovering planets around other stars, but the, the mo those that have yielded the, the most results are based either on st careful spectroscopic studies of the radial velocities of the stars as they're pulled around by their parent planets. And one of the most sensitive instruments to doing that is the HARPS, a high-resolution spectrometer in this dome, which is the 3.6-metre dome at the European uh, Southern Observatory in uh, Lucia in Chile. And on the, um, uh, on the right here is the, a spectrum of a solar-type star. Now, this is, in fact, a spectrum of the sun, so we can be confident it's a solar-type star. And the, uh, the line, you see the dark absorption lines in the, in the spectral bands due to, due to atoms and ions in the sun's atmosphere. And as the sun is pulled around by its orbiting planets, these lines undergo tiny little Doppler shifts. Um, and it's the detection of these Doppler shifts which was led to the, the first discovery of exoplanets in 1995, at least the first discovery of exoplanets around solar-type stars, a solar-type star in 1995, and has discovered about, about 500, this is the te technique that's discovered about 500 exoplanets since then. Um, the other primary technique that's uh, dis digging planets out of the sky in, in enormous numbers is the transit method. Um, which is the method used by the Kepler spacecraft and also by a number of ground-based observatories. But it's true that Kepler has, uh, the, the Kepler telescope has discovered a, um, it's turning out to be enormously productive in, in finding tran planets transiting 
uh, distant stars by monitoring the slight decrease in brightness of the star as the as planets transit. Um, obviously, the chance of you being aligned for a transit is small. It's at the few percent level. But if you can observe 100,000 stars all at once, then you will get a significant number of detections, and that's what Kepler's done. Um, I do uh, think that uh, Kepler's particularly well-named for... Um, for this uh, search for, for planets around other stars. Of course, it's been named after Kepler because Kepler was the first person to really understand planetary orbits. Um, but I came across a, um, some words of Kepler uh, written in 1610 in response to Galileo's book, The Sidereus Nuncius, which first came out that year, in which Galileo reported all his great discoveries as the first person to apply a telescope to the sky. And Kepler read this book and became very excited by it, of course, and, and wrote to Galileo in essentially a long, open letter, uh, which was then published in its own book, Conversations on the Sidereal Messenger. Um, and, in, in, and in that book, he's got this beautiful uh, phrase. He's musing about the meaning of the discoveries of all these new worlds, in this context, the satellites of Jupiter. Um, but he says, he's got this phrase in it where he says, given ships or sails adapted to the breezes of heaven, uh, there, will, there will be those who will not shrink from even that vast expense. Therefore, for the sake of those who will attempt this voyage, let us, he means himself and Galileo, establish the astronomy. And, and, and the Kepler spacecraft is doing that. It's establishing the basic astronomy of exoplanet frequencies and sizes and locations that we will need to plan interstellar missions. Um, so all these plots you'll doubtless be familiar with, they're all from the Kepler uh, website. Uh, this shows the Kepler focal plane projected onto the sky, so just, just, just north of the Milky Way, off the, near the constellation of Cygnus. And then these little boxes are the fields of view of each CCD detector in the focal plane. And then the, um, the coloured squares here are the same boxes, but every time a planet has been detected up until this was the, the release that became public in January this year, uh, little dots have been given for Earth-sized planets, super-Earth, Neptune, Jupiter-sized planets, and clearly there are a lot of them. And in the last data release, there were 2,740 candidates, uh, of the, of the vast majority of which will, not all of them, but the vast majority will be ultimately confirmed as planets, looking at the way statistics are going. Um, of course, there's a strong bias in trying to find planets like this against small planets because you're looking at dimming stars due to transits and planets in long period orbits where you only get one transit many months or years apart. Um, so having corrected for those biases as, as they were currently understood, although the data are not yet um, you know, there isn't yet a, there's still, even though the Kepler spacecraft is now sadly in trouble, there's, there's still another two years worth of data to be analysed before we can be really sure of the statistics. But even based on these, the first, the first 22 months of data, having, so these were the detections, and there aren't many Earth-sized planets, but that's because the technique is biased against small planets. Having corrected for those known biases, you ended up with statistics like this, that 17% of stars have Earth-sized planets, and 20% super-Earth and 20% Neptune. And the giant planets, which were so common in the early radial velocity surveys, actually turn out to be relatively, I mean, clearly they're present, they're relatively rare. Um, but you add all these percentages up, and they, they, you, you, you come to about 40% 40, 40, 40, 40 of stars having planets, which is already impressive. But then this data set is limited to the first 100 days of Kepler data which are planets in sort of Mercury-like orbits. And the Kepler data are not yet complete for planets in Venus or Earth or Mars-type orbits. So, so given that already 40% of stars have planets in these short period orbits, it's quite clear that when the statistics are in, all stars are going to, essentially all stars are going to be found to have planets. And that's broadly consistent with the radial velocity surveys and with the gravitational microlensing observations of planets that are very distant in, in the galactic disk. Um, there is, uh, on the Kepler website, a number of very uh, sp informative plots. And this shows one that summarizes the latest data, the data released from Kepler. It's a plot of the radius of these exoplanets relative to the Earth. So this is the size of the Earth, for one, one, one Earth radius, four Earth radius, ten, ten Earth radii. So it's a sort of Jupiter size, Neptune size, uh, Earth size. Um, and firstly, you can notice an enormous number of dots, uh, which just shows th th how many planets are being found. Um, second thing you'll notice is that all of the most, the vast majority are in uh, that are 
in, well, yes, probably it is true, the vast majority, the majority anyway, are in Earth to super-Earth mass ranges, which is kind of this, this bulk of points here, with some very low mass, almost Mars-like mass planets, but not many, um, to many that are, that are two Earth radii, so perhaps 10, ten Earth masses. Um, the thing to note is the orbital periods, right? This is 100 days. So Venus's orbit, 220 days, would be here. Earth's orbit, 365, would be there. And the data are not complete down in this corner because the, 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 the mission hasn't lasted long enough yet and may, may not last long enough now to fully gather the statistics for, that, for those relatively long orbital periods. But it's clear in the short period orbits, this enormous number of comets of Earth and super-Earth planets in periods of up to 50 days to, to or less, 100 days or less, which are for about sunlight stars too close to their stars to be habitable because they'll be closer to, their, to a sunlight star than the inner boundary of the habitable zone. But for the vast majority of stars, which are M-dwarf stars, planets in those short orbital periods do fall within the habitable zone. Uh, and it's clear there's a high fraction, tens of percent probably, of red dwarf stars do have planets within the red dwarf habitable zones. Um, so I think we, we should get, uh, which is conventionally dis defined as the, the distance from a star in which a planet with an atmosphere comparable to the Earth's would be able to support liquid water on the surface. Um, uh, Paul Davis is going to talk about habitable surfaces later, I think. I think it is important not to get too carried away with the vast number of uh, planets that are found in habitable zones. Uh, potential, all, all it means is that water could be potentially stable on the surface if the planet has a suitable atmosphere, and we don't know whether any of these planets have atmospheres suitable or not. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean they're habitable for human beings. It means at best they might be, hab they might be habitable but not inhabited, uh, or they might be inhabited by suitably evolved microorganisms. They might be suitable places for Freeman Dyson's Noah's Ark eggs to take, take um, root on, should anyone ever launch them. Um, but they're unlikely to be planet. Well, they will not be planets that are habitable for human beings. And so I think in the context of interstellar colonization, where the... The expectation is we might find amongst these planets in the habitable zone planets that are, have oxygen atmospheres and are amenable to human colonization. I think the chances of finding such a, such a planet within any realistic distance of us for interstellar travel purposes is, is probably completely negligible. But from an astrobiological point of view, that doesn't negate the interest of these planets because the chance to study alien life of any sort would, of course, be great, of great interest. So I did try and put a, together a big summary of the key results, but I'm not going to go through all of this because all you have to remember at the bottom line is essentially summarizing the radial velocity work and the, the transit work and the gravitational lens data. Basically, it's clear to everybody now that when the statistics are fully in, it's going to be found that all stars have planets to, to first order. Um, but then if all stars have planets, then it means that all of the nearest stars have planets, and so statistically. And so once we start considering the nearest stars, these are the stars that are f arguably f realistic exploration targets for the kind of interstellar space, um, uh, interstellar space tr travel concepts that Adam described earlier. Again, I'm leaving aside the advanced... Um, general if, if we find things in the laws of physics that travel that travel faster than the speed of light, then we won't, won't be limited to the local volume. But if, if, if the local volume of space, but leaving that aside, um, certainly in, con in the in the frame of the Project Icarus study that I have some involvement with, we can we've been considering that the the maximum realistic range for most of the starship designs that are currently being considered might be 15 light years, given that you want to be able to get there within a century, and especially given that you want to get there and decelerate and stop there within a century, probably the, the, the maximum realistic range for doing that within 100 years is a lot less than 15 light years. Um, anyway, within 15 light years of the, here is a diagram uh, that, that's in the book, but it's actually taken uh, courtesy of the European Southern Observatory. And it shows the volume of the local 15, radius of 15 light years from the sun. 
It's not entirely complete because within this distance there should be 58 stars and the person who drew the diagram has obviously left, left out a lot of red dwarfs because otherwise it would become very cluttered in, in all these red dwarfs. So within, within 15 light years of the sun there are about 58 known stars in 39 stellar systems and they're sort of these are, these are they, uh, but the vast majority, 40, 41 of them, are, are M dwarf stars. Um, there has been a big change recently in that I had to, I had to amend this diagram um, in that only this year the third nearest star was discovered in the sense that what was previously the third nearest star is now the fourth because this binary brown dwarf system uh, was discovered by the WISE spacecraft at 6.4 light years away, so here it is. Um, and the fact that a, a new binary star, albeit a brown dwarf binary, could uh, suddenly be discovered uh, as suddenly as this and published this just, just this January uh, reiterates the point that Freeman Dyson was making uh, yesterday. That within this volume, we've got this 58 known stars in 39 stellar systems, but there's almost certainly a lot of other stuff, unattached planets, comets, maybe more brown dwarfs still waiting, still waiting to be discovered in this volume. Um, however, uh, although I think we can be confident that essentially all of these stars will have planetary systems, looking at the current statistics, uh, we actually only know of four that have planetary systems within this volume, and one of those is slightly ropey. Um, so a, uh, most excitingly of all was the publication late last year of, a, of an Earth-sized planet orbiting Alpha Centauri b, so that is of great interest to would-be interstellar explorers because that is the closest star system. Um, Epsilon Eridani has had a, a, a planet, or well, two arguably, um, discovered some years ago, although neither of those planets are really watertight. I think there is still some controversy about the reliability of those detections. Um, this red dwarf star, um, uh, GJ679, has a super-Earth planet, but it's right at the 15 light years away. It's right at the boundary of uh, probably sufficiently far away that it wouldn't be an early exploration target. Tau Ceti is, of course, of great interest because it is a solar-type star, and it is the closest, famously the closest um, single G star to the sun. Um, and there was a paper last year that, uh, that in the radio, radio velocity work that posited the detection of, I think, five planets orbiting Tau Ceti. Um, I have to say that is certainly controversial. The signal-to-noise of those data is really very marginal. So I've stuck a question mark against Tau Ceti. But still, there are these four, four, four planets within this volume that we know or think we know have planets, or probably, possibly, in the case of Tau Ceti. But the fact is, probably all of them do, just waiting for us to discover them. Now, so I do want to now say something about Alpha Centauri because it is the uh, closest star and it does have, or probably has, at least one planet and may well have others. And being the closest star system, it lend, it's, it's likely to be the first, it suggests itself as the first target to send a starship to. So here is Alpha Centauri, this is Beta Centauri, this is the Southern Cross, this is the Coal Sack, which is a really dense part of the interstellar medium. Um, lurking down, so there are two stars here, of course, A and B, both, both unresolved in the glare of this picture. Lurking down here is about two degrees away, and not, not visible on this picture, is the red dwarf Proxima Centauri. So by sending a space vehicle to the Alpha Centauri system from a stellar astrophysics, well, from an interstellar point of view, you get to study all the interstellar medium between where you're sitting and here. Um, from a stellar astrophysics point of view, there would be three stars to study, a red dwarf, a K star, and a G star, and likely, likely, all three stars have planets, and one we think we know almost certainly does. Um, the only reason I'm slightly hesitant about this almost certainly do is that even the data on Alpha Centauri BB are not that great. This, this is the um, radial velocity data published in their Nature paper, uh, it shows the radial velocity in, of, of uh, Alpha Centauri b in metres per second. Uh, so if, there was no, if the star wasn't moving, it'd be a flat line across zero here. Uh, and the dots are the observations, and the first thing you notice is there are dots all over the place. So then you've got to do some statistical stuff to try and see whether there's a real signal in all of this noise. And, and there probably is, because if you bin these dots down, 
then uh, you get a curve that is clearly statistically significantly different from being a flat line within the error bars, although only, uh, only just. But still, I think there is a real signal here. But the thing, so, and this, so this is the evidence for a rocky planet with a minimum mass of 1.1 1, 1 .1 Earth's masses orbiting Alpha Centauri B with a period of enormous precision. <laughs> given, given the noise on this data, I'm astonished by this. 3.2357 plus or minus 0 .0008. This is about a minute accuracy quoted, cited in this paper, but anyway, mine is not to, to reason why. Um, uh, the thing to note is that this, this planet, although it's exciting to have discovered a planet around the nearest star, it's not in any sense going to be a habitable planet because with an orbital period of 3.2 days again about Alpha Centauri b, it'll, it's orbiting at a distance of 0 0.04 astronomical units. So that's, of course, Kepler's third law. Um, and at 0 0.04 astronomical units from a, um, from a K star like, like Alpha, Alpha Cen b, uh, the, the, temp the te temperature is going to be about, well, the equilibrium temperature, if it didn't have an atmosphere, would be about 1,200K, but if it does have an atmosphere, it would be hotter. Um, so this, this planet is not, is not a habitable planet. But it does, um, it does strongly, the fact that so many multiple planetary systems have been found within the Kepler data, I think this does strongly indicate that probably are other planets in this planetary system waiting to be found. Um, but they will not be easy to find. Um, the, uh, the, this is really, you can see from the noise on the data, this is really pushing the, um, the limits of um, detectability for Earth-sized planets around solar-type stars. This, this radial velocity amplitude of 0.5 metres per second, it's own, this Earth-mass planet is only giving a signal as big as that because it's so close to the star. If you took this Earth, if you took the, well, in the Earth's case, one Earth mass, one astronomical unit from a solar mass star, the radial velocity amplitude is nine centimeters per second. And it's currently beyond the detectability of the current generation of ground-based radial velocity measurements. So it's not actually possible to detect an Earth-sized planet in an Earth-sized orbit around either Alpha Centauri A or B yet just because the radial velocity signal will be below, detect below detectable levels. Uh, transits remain a possibility, but you only have a few percent chance of having the alignment right. So the chances that we have to be able to detect transits around the Alpha Sen stars, even if they do have planets, is small, and, and certainly no one's detected any yet. Um, this, is, this shows the orbit of Alpha Centauri b. Uh, about Alpha Centauri A, and this big ellipse shows the, the two stars orbit uh, each other with this, um, in, in this elliptical orbit, with, which, are, which has a sort of periastron distance of about 11 astronomical units. Um, as we see the system on the sky, though, the whole thing is tipped towards us. So viewing things on the sky, the separation of the two stars varies from being... This is... Um, this is one arc second each bin here. So this goes from a very respectable, I don't know, 20, or 20 arc seconds or so, um, to a few arc seconds. And this is important from an observational point of view, and it's another reason why confirming even the Alpha Centauri B, B planet is going to be slightly hard, in that when the observations were made, the stars were somewhere out here, and they are now on the sky, uh, getting quite close together now, and this means the light of the two stars is quite difficult to separate in the spectrometer. It's not an insuperable problem, but it's making it harder. Um, to, it will make it harder to confirm the existence of even the planet that we do have. Um, and um, we're going into a stage now where you can see the stars are going to be quite close together on the sky for some time. By about 2020, they'll be reasonably apart again and then as, it, as, it, as they go around their orbit with a period of about 80 years. Um, anyway, uh, Jim showed this picture um, yesterday. It shows a quite a nice sketch, summary sketch of the geometry of the Alpha Centauri system. Um, it's from a, a, a quite a nice article by Martin Beach that was published in the journal Astronomy and Geophysics last year, where he reviewed the Alpha Centauri system. Um, and it shows the, uh, the, two, the geometries of the two stars at their closest approach, 11 astronomical units as they go around their big elliptical orbit, stuck out there, 13,000 astronomical units away is Proxima. Um, then drawn to scale in these green bands are the conventionally 
defined habitable zones around these stars, but that's the, the range where liquid water would be stable if the planet had an Earth-like atmosphere. It's a, a lot of caveats to be added to the concept of a habitable zone. Um, the thing to note, though, is the planet that's been detected around Alpha Centauri B at point 0.4 of an astronomical unit is still within the, the size of my laser pointer here, right? Um, so the, the, these are, these are point 0.4 of an astronomical unit apart, these rings. So um, point 0.04 is in there. And so to detect planets in the habitable zones of either of these stars requires uh, radial velocity precision much, much greater than current current techniques have. So unless we're lucky with a transit confirming the presence of planetary systems in the habitable zones of these stars will be quite difficult. Um, I want to say something about Proxima. Um, it, is, it is the closest star, just as Jim to the Earth, as Jim said, known star. And I think we have to add that caveat now that these brown dwarfs are being found. Um, um, but it's, um, it has been studied, of course, in great detail by the radial velocity people, and there are quite tight limits onto the, the, the mass of planets that may, be, may exist around Proxima Centauri. So none have been discovered, but then we can ask ourselves, given our sensitivity, what limits, what upper limits does that place on the mass around the planets around Proxima Centauri? Um, and this paper, bon Bonfils et al., uh, in, published earlier this year, um, shows a. They've got this. They've got diagrams like this for for hundred. Well, score does scores of red local red dwarf stars. But I've just picked out the the, the Proxima one. Um, basically shows the detection limits. So this shows um, perioded days. So ten days, a hundred days, a thousand days. Logarithmic plot. And these are the uh, also a logarithmic plot are the minimum mass m sine i values in Earth masses. One Earth mass. Uh, ten Earth masses. A hundred Earth masses. A thousand Earth masses. And here is the projected habitable zone around this uh, M dwarf star. So things with an orbital period of about 10 days would be close enough to be within the habitable zone around this M dwarf star. And then this is the detection limit. Basically what it means is anything above this line with masses bigger than that or periods uh, longer than anything that's above this sloping line would have been detected by the existing radial velocity surveys. So it means we would have detected planets around... Um, we, planets with masses between three and five Earth masses in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri would have been discovered by now. So super-Earth mass planets or giant planets with moons are excluded in the, in the Proxima Centauri habitable zone, but Earth mass planets or Mars mass planets are not excluded by the current data and, and may, may, may for all we know exist. Kepler data would suggest there's quite a high probability that they do, but it will require much more sensitive um, techniques to discover them. So, uh, what might we do to uh, build upon what we already know? Obviously, there are several there are several uh, projects in in design or even being built uh, which can help advance our knowledge that um, of, of planets around the nearest stars. So large space telescopes will help insofar as if we can actually directly image planets orbiting nearby stars, we won't be reliant on the, sens the sensitivity of radial velocity surveys. That's interesting that that's gone blank. What do I have to do? Maybe I press return or something. Oh, good. Oh, just my screen went blank. Okay. Um, so the James Webb Space Telescope will be a start. It would have been much better had it been built with a coronagraph or a free-flying coronagraph, as was talked about at some time. Um, but still, there is a possibility that space telescopes like um, um, James Webb Space Telescope may be able to directly image planets around nearby stars. And looking at the difficulty of confirming Earth-sized planets, certainly in the Alpha Centauri habitable zones, uh, by the radial velocity technique and the difficulty of the low probability of it having transits in any one case, direct imaging may well become the preferred choice for confirming planets around the nearest stars, but it will require large space-based telescopes. Uh, quite an exciting, the TESS mission, uh, due, just recently uh, funded by, by NASA, will be able to, will do targeted surveys of transits around nearby stars, so this will be very exciting, but the chance of any individual nearby star exhibiting transits is, of course, low. European Space Agency is working on the ECHO 
concept, which is a space, a space telescope that would study the atmospheric composition of transiting, transiting um, uh, planets around nearby stars by taking spectra of the star, <coughs> taking spectra of the star-planet combination, and then taking spectra when the planet is eclipsed by the star, and then subtracting those two signals, leaving the spectrum of the planet. So it's quite an exciting possibility. And then the advent of the really large 30 to 50 meter ground-based telescopes, provided the adaptive optics can really be got to work to its theoretically maximum possible extent, then these very large um, telescopes, 20 or 30 meters across, if they can be made to work close to their diffraction limit, would uh, also be very arguably able to directly image planets around nearby stars. Um, I've almost almost come to the end. A couple of a couple of slides to go, but um, in, I think in the future, if we really want to characterise planets around the nearest stars uh, for scientific reasons and for coming up with a priority list to which to send interstellar space probes to, we are ultimately going to need much larger astronomical tools than than we currently have. And I think large space-based telescopes, this is the European Space Agency's Darwin concept now, uh, now on hold. Uh, and there was a comparable NASA concept, which is now also on hold, uh, TPF, Terrestrial Planet Finder. But these large space-based large space -based telescopes are, are operating as interferometers, which would have both a light grasp and the, the angular resolution to separate stars from planets and obtain spectra of these planets. Uh, are probably going to be required, certainly if we're going to try and identify planets around the nearest stars and then prioritise them in terms of their scientific interest, their potential habitability, or even whether they're inhabited or not. So here is a well-worn diagram. Many of you will have seen it before, but it's the kind of noisy, um, rather poor spectrum that an alien astronomer might have if they've had a Darwin-type space telescope array pointed at our solar system from a distance of 10 parsecs or so. And they'd be able to resolve the, uh, these, the, the, the Venus, Earth, and Mars as planets. And taking spectra of them, they would notice that Mars and Venus had CO2-rich atmospheres. And uh, the Earth has CO2 in its atmosphere, but it also has water vapor and ozone. And, and that would be a, enough to trigger great interest in planet number three. Uh, because the argument would go the oxygen has had to be produced somehow to significant concentration. The presence of water uh, fulfills a a, at least one of the criteria for habitability. The density of the Earth would imply it was a rocky planet. Water on rocky planets means that you can generate hydrogen by serpentinizing basaltic rocks and so there's a potential for CO2 is present, so a potential for microorganisms at least to... Um, be uh, converting hydrogen, reacting hydrogen with carbon dioxide to make uh, to drive metabolisms, and something's producing this oxygen. So, so immediately, planet number three would become of interest. And if, and if we got spectra like this of a planet around in the habitable zone of Alpha Centauri or Proxima or any of the nearby stars, this would, uh, from a scientific perspective, immediately elevate that that system to the top, probably of a ranking of targets for us to send our, our starships to. Um, but I do want to caution, though, there is a limit to what we can learn from astronomical spectroscopy. Um, and in particular, no matter how big the telescopes get or however good the spectroscopy gets, it's not going to uh, obviate the need for direct investigation of these planets with spaceships, starships, in effect. Um, so I argued earlier that... Uh, even if we have a planet that we think has life on it, if we want to study its cellular structure, its biochemistry, its ecology, its evolutionary history, all of that will require direct investigation. But we may even need direct investigation to be sure whether a spectral signature really is life or evidence for life or not. Um, we had a, a meeting in the Royal, Royal Society in the UK a few weeks ago on exoplanets, and my colleague uh, Charles Cockell from um, now at the University of Edinburgh uh, gave a very insightful um, paper on the difficulties of proving that life is present by spectroscopic means alone if you don't know anything about the basic underlying planet, which we won't. So he wrote, um, uh, even, even using atmospheric tracers like these, 
Um, he wrote that for many atmospheric gases, the lack of a knowledge about these exoplanets, uh, including whether they've got plate tectonics or not, hydrosphere, geosphere interactions, ge crustal geochemical cycling, gaseous sources and sinks, etc., makes it impossible to distinguish a putative biotic contribution to this atmosphere uh, from an inorganic one, no matter what the resolving power of your telescope is. So having got an interesting spectrum, we will probably need a starship to determine whether it's actually life or not, to prove it, but to prove to ourselves whether it's actually life or not. And we will certainly need a starship to study that life in any, um, in any sort of detail. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Ian. I want to ask the first question now. It was surprising since a year ago, Wise was telling us there are no brown dwarfs within 10 light years. Trust me, right? And I talked to some of the investigators. They were pretty, pretty sure about it. And then, surprise, well, there's one that's six years light, light years away. And the extrapolation of the density versus size, that is numerous, number versus size, uh, uh, toward the small masses would indicate that there really should be some nearer than that. So do you think we may see some surprising, some future surprises from WISE? Well, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the WISE instrument to, to really comment directly on that, but I think we would be wise to expect the unexpected. I think, I think it was a, it was a wake-up call, you know, that suddenly we could have a new third nearest star out of nowhere, and I right. think it is a... So, so I think well, I'm sort of first nearest brown dwarf, but but third, third nearest new new third nearest star. So I think I think this does. I mean, it does just reiterate what Freeman Dyson was saying yesterday. There's going to be all sorts of things between these nearby stars which we don't know about yet, and I think we should be prepared to expect them. Yes. I've got a question about this last comment from Cockle, which I hadn't seen before. Um, if you see an O3 line, and you can somehow find the temperature of the planet, that would tend to exclude things like the Venusian sort of model in which you get ozone at, at the top, I would think. Well, no, 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 I agree. So if, if you were to find an ozone line, maybe, maybe this is the, the bad example. If you, if, if you were to find an ozone line, then it's a very strong diagnostic of biology. It's not to say there are not abiotic ways to produce ozone, because there are, but, but our, our expectation would be you'd only have a strong ozone line if there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, and there's a strong argument uh, that that would be produced by photosynthesis. But proving that by telescopic means alone might be quite hard. But in the case of what, what is a far more likely result, that you find a, a planet with a spectrum that um, uh, has... Looks like it's got a strong CO2 line here, but it's got, and it's got a water band here, and it doesn't have ozone. Then that would be the spectral signature of a planet that you would expect to be habitable, but very little way of proving that it's in fact inhabited just through spectroscopic means alone. Uh, John. Yeah, once I did a little computer graphics exercise in which I took the, the planets, uh, the stars near the, uh, the solar system and calculated in the, in the middle of the habitable zone how big the star would look in, uh, in the sky in terms of solid angle. And I was surprised when I did the K and M's to find out how, that, that it's absolutely huge. Yes. And since the tidal forces scale with the, um, <clears throat> with the size of the object in the sky, this prob very probably means that, all of that almost all of the planets for those weak uh, emitting suns are going to be tide locked and therefore only questionably inhabitable. Well, I certainly agree they'd be questionably inhabited. I think certainly for most, for most red dwarf stars, the habitable zone does imply tide locked planets. Um, there has been recent work, there's been a paper by Wordsworth and others relatively recently who have demonstrated that for sufficiently thick CO2 atmospheres, the atmosphere can arguably transfer the heat around the planet to the, to, the, to the night side and maintain habitable conditions. But I agree with you completely. It does. Po I mean, it's one reason why it's a bit premature to get too excited by the very large number of planets that Kepler has found in the habitable zone, because the vast majority of those are red dwarf stars, just imposed by the, the current time limits on the Kepler data. That will improve. 
Um, and a ha something that's in the habitable environment around a red dwarf star will be a very strange planet. And, it, and even if it is habitable in the sense of being able to support liquid water, it's certainly only habitable to, will only be habitable to suitably evolved uh, uh, microbial life, I think. And so one shouldn't have visions that the galaxy is full of planets that are one can suddenly send our colony ships to colonize. I think that's really very unlikely within the local local volume of the galaxy in which we find ourselves. No. Nope. Yeah, that's... I think that's perfectly true. So, I mean, I think everything we know, I mean, this, the universe is always surprising, is right? The diversity of things out there in, 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 the, in the galaxy will certainly be certainly beyond anything that we can really easily anticipate. So there will be all sorts of possibilities. Um, and I, I certainly agree with, you know, there are, there are many possibilities for habitable uh, environments the, around Ren, M dwarf stars. Yeah, the, um, I agree also not only with moons, but also moons uh, and other objects. We're finding out that there's so many of them are uh, roofed um, oceans, and that puts a whole different light on things in about 20 different ways. But I wanted to ask about the methodologies. First, Kepler, and of course, uh, if Kepler is lost, I think the entire political world will admit that this is a high priority for a next generation replacement. But then the uh, radial velocity is the other great method. But there was the method that was used originally to try to find planets, and that's astrometry. And um, the proper motions, variation in proper motions. And do you know of any attempts to try to use that as a third supplement? Well, so, so several things. Firstly, uh, as regards the habitable zone, I, I, you're absolutely right. The whole concept of the habitable zone is banded around without any caveats at all, where in fact the, there are many caveats that need to be added to it. And so, so we've got places like Europa, which are outside the habitable zone, but probably perfectly habitable, and such places in exoplanetary systems would be of enormous interest, <laughs> regardless of whether they're in the local habitable zone or not, because they will in fact be habitable. Um, with regard to astrometry, astrometry, ground-based astronomy has always been prone by the, the problem of atmospheric seeing and stability. This is being addressed with adaptive optics. But I think the next real breakthrough here will be the Gaia mission. So this is the European Space Agency's big um, successor to the Hipparchus astrometry satellite. And Gaia will have the astrometric precision to detect planets orbiting nearby stars through their um, their, their, their wobble angular of displacement on the sky. So I didn't mention it, but I, I, yes, we should be mindful of the fact that the Gaia mission will be able to detect planets around nearby stars through the proper motion wobble. Oh, okay. Um, you made the point early on that it's harder to figure out how to decelerate even after you've figured out how to accelerate your ship. Uh, but that flybys have limited science payback for these kind of questions you're discussing now. Um, can you see an uh, um, argument for the fact that robotics might um, and probably will develop so much more rapidly that you could put, you could drop off smart robots as you fly by to, to work on these problems? And curiosity wouldn't be one, because curiosity can't do anything about finding life, extant or extinct. It can look for the conditions for life. Well, so, so you're absolutely right. So I use curiosity as an example of a kind of sophisticated package that you might want to deploy on these planets. But you, you, if you were looking for life itself, you wouldn't deploy curiosity. So you would be informed by what you'd learned about these planets spectroscopically and try and design a scientific payload accordingly. Um, I think whatever you drop off has to be decelerated, right? So this, this might be a question for Jeffrey Landis or for Adam. Um, obviously, if, you, if it's got a small mass, it will require less energy to decelerate, but it's still going very fast at 10% of the speed of light or whatever it is. So it's not clear that that's going to be all that easily achieved. But I, I agree within the people who think about the architecture for interstellar missions, this is something that should be looked at. I am certain that it will be necessary to decelerate scientific payloads. I think just as I made the point that ground-based optical astronomy had probably discovered most of what it could, not all of what it 
most of what it could about the planets of our solar system prior to the space age, and the real revolution came when it was possible to send spacecraft to, to the other planets. Um, I really think the way uh, the tremendous advances are being made in astronomical techniques, large ground-based telescopes, the possibility for big space interferometers, well before the end of the 21st century, before we're in a position to build starships, I think we'll have astronomical tools that will tell us as much about these other planetary systems as what uh, ground-based 19th century astronomy was telling us about the planets of our own solar system. I think that much we can learn through astronomical tools. But taking the next leap, um, certainly on the astrobiology side, will require in situ measurements. And I, however you do it, that is going to require decelerating scientific instruments at the other end. Jeffrey wants to answer the point. I can't remember, Jill. I'll have to. We have to Google that. Very, very short uh, comment, confirming what you said, and then very short question. We know from Kepler transiting atmospheric observation that indeed you can have 6,000 mile an hour winds from the substellar part moving hot gas, but that's certainly not a habitable planet. The real question is. If you observe the spectrum of uranium and other uh, heavy radioactive things, there was civilization, right? Uh, yes, although uh, a few caveats there. <laughs> Firstly, you'd want you would want to see what, whether the abundances of these artificial elements really really were going to produce some um, detectable spectral lines with the kind of instruments that we might build. Um, but I, 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 I really, well, I'm, maybe I'm prejudging it. I don't think we should be expecting to find evidence for civilizations past or present within the local 15 uh, light years of the sun. I think the, the probability of, of finding, finding that is, well, one should keep an open mind, but I think it's probably very Okay. Small. Our last question is, uh, or comment is from Jeff. Actually, just a couple of comments on Joel's question. It seems that there is actually two possibilities other than uh, flyby and decelerating. Uh, the first possibility is to decelerate some but don't stop, uh, because it looks like particularly with the work of Bob Zerber and Dana Andrews, uh, working with Jonathan Post's suggestion, uh, it is possible to decelerate with a magnetic sail that won't bring you to a stop but will decrease your flyby velocity significantly from the yeah. sub-relativistic. So that's one possibility. But, 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 but just sorry to interrupt, it's not enough. It, it, does, it doesn't matter whether curiosity or some robotic equivalent it's is It's not enough by to it. stop, but a slow flyby is going to be much more scientifically valuable I, than a 10% of the speed of light I, I, flyby. I, I'm, I'm unconvinced by that, Jay. It will be more valuable because right. it will buy you more observing time but it won't allow you to make in the kind of in situ measurements uh, that really, oh, clear, clear. really, sure. really, really okay. require. I'm just pointing out that there's so, a, a third possibility that needs to be in the trade space. Uh, there's also a fourth possibility, uh, which is to land on the planet without slowing down at all. Uh, this is an impactor probe. Uh, if there is a civilization on the planet, they might consider this a hostile act. Uh, but. But nevertheless, this is a technique that we've used in our solar system uh, with vehicles such as Deep Impact and possibly could learn quite a lot by producing a, a very high temperature plasma cloud of a, a sample of a planet. Well, th there, there I, well, <laughs> so, so I, I, I agree with you. More, more can be learned from uh, uh, in situ measurements of any kind and, and, and penetrators would be a, an advance over a, over a, a slow flyby. Okay, we've, we've reached the chaos stage here. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, that's the end of uh, this morning's session. Now we're going to break for lunch and uh, resume at 1.30 for the afternoon session. And I'm going to try to get those sale movies running, and I'll show them just before the afternoon session. Bye-bye. Well, okay, let's get to A.